Hey, everybody. Welcome to Chaos Community Broadcast, Episode Zero. Nate, we're really glad to have you on the show. And Casey, uh, a pleasure as always. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, today well, we have... I, I, I have a very minor... I go by Nathan. Sorry. We'll, we'll fix that in post. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, today... we can fix in post. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> My All right, would so die. <laughs> today we have with us Nathan Ashbacher. Uh, welcome to the show. You're the CEO of Oxoff. Uh, yes, Oxoff is correct. It's uh, it's the sequel to Oxon in the Karate Kid series. Again, again, we'll fix that in post. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're kicking off this series uh, with uh, authors from um, contributing authors from the, the Chaos Engineering uh, book. Um, and you wrote a chapter in that. Congratulations on being published. Um, yeah, have you um, have you read your chapter? Uh, I mean, I wrote it, and then I had to read it before it went to uh, to, to production. Um, I had other people also read it, and um, we were all fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought so, it was great. I, uh, thank I, you. I'm, yeah, I. Um, I, I memorized it, uh, page 215 to 226. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, this is this is important to me. So maybe I took it a little bit more seriously than you how, did. How do I get a copy of the book? That's one thing I don't. I've seen a lot of people posting pictures. Uh, I'll have my people call your people. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Thanks. Uh, so uh, before we uh, we get to your to your work, um, you and I uh, know each other. I think we've known each other for at least a few weeks. Um, in fact, you used a, a picture of my dog Nietzsche in in one of your presentations on chaos engineering at the Chaos Community Day in Minneapolis um, yes. a couple of years ago. Yeah, uh, that Nietzsche passed away in January. Oh, I'm very I'm quite sorry. I did not know that. So. It, to be fair, my use of I'm, this I'm not was, suggesting that you had anything to do with it. Well, I mean, it wasn't that popular of a talk, so I don't think it could have really exposed your uh, your wonderful canine friend to any kind of undue influence in the outside world. I don't have that kind of following. Um, but failures you know. in complex systems can be interesting. So, yeah. um, why don't well, you give ask, us a, so did, did you have distributed tracing deployed in Nietzsche? so that we could figure this out. Uh, so why don't you tell us about yourself and, and Oxon? What is it that Oxon does? Uh, yeah, so Oxon, um, its sort of broader goal is to create sort of a, a new class of uh, computer-aided engineering tools. So um, you know, other industries like mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, electrical engineers have a lot of really sophisticated tools to deal with uh, sort of complexity, certainly. Um, both in kind of like the design and verification phases of their development or their work. Um, my experience, having been in the software engineering world for quite a long time, uh, is that our tools, some there are some very sophisticated tools. Uh, some of them are very sort of academic in their use and are not broad, sort of broadly deployed and are difficult to use. You have to really want to use them to get over the various warts and humps that are, that are involved. And so we created Oxen just to be able to, oh, sweet Moses, uh, <laughs> uh, to be able to create. Um, yeah, this is a visual <laughs> cue for people to indicate that you've been talking for a long time about potentially boring things. Continue. Too long, that's a good visual cue, I like it. Uh, all right, sure, the, so, so Oxen is about um, to create a sort of a next generation of computer aided engineering tools for helping deal with complexity in in software intensive systems, so uh, embedded devices, cyber physical systems, so these kinds of things. The first goal, the first sort of product that we're trying to put out there um, is trying to be like the software equivalent of what in the materials testing world they call a universal testing machine. Uh, so it's, it's the reason we have fancy things like finite element analysis, um, where we spent two centuries breaking wood and steel and you know these kinds of things. And, recording data and understanding how they, the sort of faults and failure lines in these things. Uh, and then later, after we had these big corpuses of information, we're able to turn those into fairly sophisticated models for doing design and sort of simulation and things of that nature. Uh, and so what we're trying to, to sort of bring out to the market first is kind of the cyber physical systems version or embedded systems version of uh, the universal testing machine to create the sort of 
uh, virtual hydraulic press, as it were. Like, let's push on these things and see how they uh, how they react, and then record that information and learn from that that data. That's a mouthful. So, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also the father of uh, chaos theory. Is that correct? Um, uh, uh, many of my elementary school teachers would have considered me that, yes, but I take no particular claim. Wasn't it you who said if a butterfly flaps its wings in China and it tickles someone's nose and they sneeze, it causes a pandemic and economic collapse halfway around the world? Is that not you? I, no, that was not me. I actually, they, I had stated Vietnam, so I don't like being misquote there. Okay. Apologies for that. Can you define uh, cyber physical systems? You talk about that a lot in the book. Yeah, so a cyber physical system uh, is, is kind of an extension of what we what people tend to typically think of as an embedded system. Uh, usually they are small devices that are somehow connected to each other or to other pieces of infrastructure. Um, very often they are some combination of some kind of sensor and or some number of sensors some capacity to run you know, some kind of algorithm on those things and then communicating that information to the, uh, to the world around them. Uh, but most principally, they have an, an effect on their environment. Like they are interacting with their environment around them. So uh, like automated manufacturing, the robotic arms that you see in like the production of cars, right? If you've ever seen the inside of uh, you know, Tesla's uh, production facility, they have you know, videos of these things running and these big six axis arms you know, doing things there. Um, those kinds of things. So they're, they have, they're, they cover a lot broad series of domains. Sometimes, you know, IOT kind of falls into that domain. Uh, but at the end of the day, the big differentiating factor is that they, uh, they're interacting with the world around them. They're trying to perceive it somehow and, and manipulating their environment somehow. Nathan, if the, if the autonomous car thing doesn't work out, have you considered pivoting to autonomous humans? Uh, one of the things about the name of our company, Oxen, is that it sounds like one of the original autonomous vehicles, the Ox, um, and it was sort of a uh, tongue-in-cheek poke at that possibly autonomous cars have already been solved. We just, they were animals. That's um, very clever. And your background is in IT. Uh, most of chaos engineering uh, currently happens in, in IT or, or you know, strictly in software. Uh, was there a particular catalyst for you to, to move from IT uh, into the into cyber physical systems? Yeah, I had an, a fantastic opportunity to work at a company um, and be head of engineering that was working in the autonomous vehicle space, not in the, the making of the brains of the autonomous vehicle, but some of the infrastructure that was responsible for managing the systems in the autonomous vehicle. Um, and it was it was such an interesting intersection of criticality like I had not experienced before in uh, in sort of the IT world, like previously having been a Visa, payment switchers are very critical, but they're a different kind of critical than something, uh, a computer system that is responsible for the safety of the people inside and outside of this apparatus. Um, and so having an opportunity to go there and interact with the safety concerns and the challenges that many of the, uh, the folks who have been making very safe systems for a very long time, right? I mean, cars have gotten safer and safer over uh, many decades and they're constantly trying to improve there uh, and seeing an opportunity to bring uh, sort of automation and new forms of like rigor and software testing and software systems testing to a domain that has really great tools and capabilities around mechanical Sorry to cut you off there. Uh, yeah. We now have a word from our sponsors. Uh, Chaos Community Broadcast is brought to you by Naps Root Beer. Na James, do I have to actually read this? Uh, yeah, yeah, Casey, um, you got to read. I mean, that. this is this is ridiculous. This is like old English or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you said you wanted a sponsor for Gas Community Broadcast. We brought one in. So all right, all right, okay, okay, okay. all right, all yep. right. Um, hello, Rip Van Winkle. What a pity you don't drink root beer made from Naps root beer extract. It doesn't inebriate. People reach for Naps root cause analysis shows it to be one of the pleasantest and healthiest beverages known. It doesn't even make any sense. Uh, it's it's, it's invigorating qualities are such as to recommend it alike to the invalid as well as to those in the enjoyment of good health. That's, that, that's, that's absurd. Um, hey, that's, that's, that's what we have, Casey. 
So that's what we're. All right. Well, we're our broadcast is brought to you by our fine sponsors, and if you know of anybody who is more respectable sponsor, we would love to be put in contact with them. You know, I might be aging myself a little bit here, but um, I was a, a, a soda jerk at a parlor in Philadelphia. Um, what are you a hundred? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I don't want to intimidate you uh, with my age, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we. Um, uh, it was one time the mayor, the mayor at the time was Rudolph uh, Blankenberg. True fact, that was his actual name, Rudolph Blankenberg, came in and, and uh, we served him some uh, naps, root beer extract, and you know phosphorus soda, and it gave him a coughing fit. And the tabloids picked up on it, and they thought that. Uh, they thought he had the Spanish flu, so like all of downtown was closed. I I was, uh, you know, basically out of work, stuck at home for weeks. Uh, something you won't be able to imagine. No, that, that'd be hard to relate anyway, to. You might yeah, want to cut that um, in post. That's not very relatable. So, uh, 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 Nathan, um, you were you were talking about autonomous vehicles. Uh, I overheard someone say that I have a great theory for <clears throat> why autonomous cars are so difficult to build, which goes something like this. We have the GPU power and raw com computational power to solve the physics of driving cars. That's the easy part. Uh, so that's not the problem. Autonomous vehicles can sense the road conditions and protect, uh, project physical systems with far greater accuracy than uh, any of you humans. The problem is that humans drive with a theory of mind that they project onto other drivers, right? Humans have context from years of being human uh, which allows them to anticipate the intentions of other drivers. That's a difficult problem to solve, even with big data machine learning approach. Um, so on a scale of say 37 to 25, how correct is that theory by me? Uh, 36. I think that is a good thing. Uh, okay. Um, Aren't there already planes, cars, pacemakers, et cetera, in the world, and, and don't they work just fine? Where's where's the where's the position for Oxon to actually improve uh, yeah. physical systems? So there's been a big jump in sort of like internal demand driven by the industry, um, as well as sometimes marketplace needs uh, by consumers or t around sort of the automation or the autonomy, not like in the autonomous car sense, but just like the autonomy of a system to, to manage itself and be deployed uh, for long periods of time uh, and have to react to its, its own conditions. Many of these things are transitioning to being much more specifically software intensive. So as I mentioned previously, uh, there are fantastic tools for electrical engineers for like electronic design automation, uh, for the mechanical engineers who are designing these components uh, to be able to sort of stress them virtually before actually fabricating anything. Uh, and there are some there are some pretty good tools on the software side. There are things like model based design tools from the folks like uh, at MathWorks around Simulink and things that are kind of shaped like that. Uh, if you're trying to design like your your control algorithm or something of this nature, uh, but there's a, a much larger problem around the complexity of integrating all these components together, and especially when they have really high uh, degrees of software control. So one of the I kind of touch on this in the book a little bit. Um, and I think, in fact, like Nancy Levison brings this up as well in some of her writing, which is there's an interesting sort of condition around software, which is that uh, it, some folks say that it's impossible to have a software error, like in the, it doesn't fail in like the functional safety sense because it just does what it's told. The problem, though, is that the, the things that we don't expect, whether or not we classify it as a failure that software can do, uh, have a way to be like a contagion in a system, like a small change in one corner, kind of a really big impact depending on who's calling this, say, like a function where it's being called, what they expect, and it can be pervasive as it sort of goes out into the software uh, of a sort of a broader platform. Um, the, there's a, another component to that is that they can be upgrade, updated so trivially, right? So it might be the case that I've deployed the software for say like a, a closed loop ventilator where yesterday the software was fine and everything seemed to be working okay. We did a minor update in something that seemed entirely unrelated and it might still have an impact ultimately on uh, the safety or the performance of that of that critical uh, you know component or device, um, and so trying to come up with a way to uh, to get over this hump of being able to provide sort of like direct visibility into the interactions between these different things in the system in a way that is more exhaustive than the kinds of procedures that they that they tend to do today. So a lot of uh, a lot of this function of integrating these components would be the responsibility of what would typically be like a systems engineering organization. And they act as kind of the glue and fabric in an organization for uh, the overall like nature of a system, the 
interactions between like the hardware team and the software team and, and things like this. Uh, and a lot of what they deal with is really spreadsheet driven. So, you know, they're, they're managing requirements and they're uh, trying to do test reviews and things of this nature. Um, but it has a, it, it, it's really slow. It's very expensive to do. It's very um, uh, sort of human resource intensive. A lot of times people don't want to go back and update the context of their assumptions because it's a very expensive process to engage in. And it's also quite like lossy and inspecific. Right? It's the things that we think up that we write down in spreadsheets may not actually be informed by the reality of the system that we're dealing with. And so for us, it's looking at this intersection of like high software integration with high needs for automation and then trying to bleed out uh, the sort of uncertainty or as much uncertainty as we can in the interactions between different components in a system. Uh, and it's in that like where the market is going in this dimension where we're, uh, where we're angling. In, uh, in the book, you talk about the probe effect, which on the surface sounds like a graphic mid-80s sequel to Close Encounters, but it actually means something much more sophisticated. Can you speak to that? Yeah, it's actually a representation of a graphic mid-70s uh, alien encounter. Um, so, so, actually though, <laughs> probe, so probe effect is, uh, is something that's fairly common um, a common consideration in say like electrical engineering or electric uh, you know, circuit design uh, where the instruments that you use to measure things actually have an impact on the measurement, right? They, they don't exist in a vacuum. You can't take a perfect, you know, cost-free measurement. Um, there may be some, uh, you know, like current draw from the, like the, 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 the tool that's being like connected to the circuit. Um, and we, I, the, the concept is sound I and mean, it's been used in a lot of other domains for, for quite a long time. And it maps to the software world pretty well, right? If you if you turn on, um, like even like if you turn on tracing in the Linux kernel, for instance, like it has a performance impact, and it might actually be that it's the performance impact that's causing the problem that you're observing in some cases. Uh, and so, trying to put boundary conditions or trying to establish that uh, that whatever effect it's having is not having an effect on what you care to be measuring is a really important part of trying to understand. Uh, whether or not your testing is the problem, you know, rather than the system that's under test. What what kind of resistance uh, do you find out there to, to what you're doing? Well, I mean, it's a it, many of the industries that we're going into, you know, like the medical device you know, world or the automotive world, um, you know, aerospace. They do have very sophisticated tools and a lot of practices and procedures that they have leaned on for a really long time. Um, so often what we'll find is, well, we've, we've been doing this for you know, 20 years already and things seem to be going okay. Um, in the next, you carry the conversation on further, um, you'll be able to get them to describe all kinds of weird corner cases that cropped up during development. So there's a dissonance between uh, wanting to defend that they've been like, very good at what they're doing for a very long time, which is absolutely true. You know, airplanes aren't like, often randomly dropping out of the sky and pacemakers mostly work. And things of this nature, um, but when they're when you start to sort of poke and prod at the okay, but now it's connected to some cloud service that your you know the auto manufacturer is you know has deployed, or um, now it's a closed loop. It's not somebody managing their diabetes through like open loop human intervention. It's actually like a closed loop between some pen cap reading and like a mobile device in the cloud. Um, they go you know you can start to get people to uh, to expose that there are huge challenges in uh, in making sure that any of these things are actually working and coordinating with one another in the way that they need to in the face of, of failures that they don't think of, right? Um, you, and so you, you I, talk a, you, sorry, you talk a lot about failures. Would you say failure is the basis of your experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say like mostly I'm a colossal failure. I think that's true, yeah. But, but I think but the, let this be a lesson to the kids out there that like you can be bad at basically everything and still be the CEO of a funded startup. Okay, <clears throat> I think we have some questions from the audience. Um, That's right. James? Yeah. Uh, yep. Nathan and Casey, we've got uh, a couple of questions come in. So let me uh, let me pull those in here real quick. Hi, this is Matt. Uh, Nathan, thanks for putting this book out there. I have a question for Casey. Um, I've always considered chaos engineering as something you do in production. Can you do it in pre-prod? Um, actually, I was hoping uh, we had some questions for Nathan yeah. since he's the guest. Yeah, here, I so thought maybe we can. Take yeah, I'm sorry call. about that. I, yeah, sorry, we. Uh, I didn't really get these callers sorted out just right. Um, 
That's somehow Sorry, also exactly what I expected Matt's like work environment to look like. I don't know why. All right, so uh, here's here's our uh, next caller. Yeah, uh, sorry about that, Nathan. Hi, my name's Carol. First time caller, long time listener. Thanks so much for taking my question. So my question is, what's the best way to get started with a continuous verification practice if you work at a non-cloud native company? Uh, so the difference between validation and verification um, is is often confused, or, and I say that like not in that people get confused about it, but that it's sometimes unclear to even practitioners, uh, which is why- No, 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 no. I was actually hoping Casey could respond. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, well, thanks well, for coming I'm, I'm, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer specifically. So validation <laughs> is, uh, did I build the right thing? And verification is, did I build it right? Okay, we're, we're just gonna cut that part. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll thanks for coming post. on the show, uh, Nathan. Um, best of luck to you at Oxon. And I hope people read your chapter so that they don't uh, murder people with autonomous cars. Or other types of devices. Okay, well, that's been the, the, the episode. Uh, Nathan, Casey, I think it was quite something for our, for our viewers. And, um, uh, Nathan, we hope to have you back on the show uh, in the yeah, near future. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to, uh, to come on the show anytime. I, I, I would turn down late night for this. It's not right really on. promises. Thanks.